Hello everyone! Today I'm going to be doing a book talk for not Chain of Gold but the last hours kind of but I'm more going to focus on Chain of Thorns than anything. Um, before I start this if you guys haven't read these books please leave unless you don't care about being spoiled because I'm going to spoil the heck out of you. So bye if you haven't read this book. First off I want to talk about the audiobook. I hated the audiobook. It's my it was how I got through these books. I'm going to be completely honest with you guys right now. Besides the last book, I do not think I would have gotten through the first two books without the audiobook because the audiobook was there. It was constant and just making it so I couldn't pause. But every time I set the book down, I didn't want to pick the book back up. It was, it, that had nothing to do with the audiobook either. I just genuinely didn't like anything that was happening. I love the world. Don't get me wrong. I love the world so much. I love the re the returning characters like Jem, Will, Tessa, Charlotte, all of them, Magnus especially. I loved all of them, but I hated our new characters because let's be honest, our new characters, especially in this first book, have absolutely no personality at all. James has the excuse of being, you know, controlled by a magic bracelet. Not, well, and Matthew has an excuse too because of everything that happened to him in the novellas. But no one else has an excuse. But I was talking about the audiobook and I jumped ahead. The audiobook, the narrator is just not good. I hate the voice she gives for Will. I hate how when, some, when one of the bad guys is amused or is being cynical or is just taunting, they sound like they're really pouty and all of their voices are really gravelly and it just is not good. <laughs> she does some voices good, but most of the time I just can't stand it. But regardless, I did choose to read the audiobooks because I couldn't get through these books on my own and that's just sad. So while I can't recommend the audiobooks, if you find yourself putting this book down multiple times and just not being able to get through it, actually the series as in general, just pick up the audiobook. <laughs> because that is going to be the best way to read it just to you know get through it because the you know the narrator unless you pause her she doesn't stop reading so you kind of can't stop reading either until you pause her anyways um i just didn't care for the characters in this book leaned this book leaned so heavily on nostalgia i feel like and didn't spend the time we could have been we could, well, we could have spent a lot more time developing these characters and their personality if it hadn't been for the fact that it spent a lot of the time, I guess, setting up this time period and all of the, the restrictions for what is proper in society at this time, which let's be honest, they're shadow hunters. I know that these shadow hunters is a, it's a very soft generation they haven't had to deal with a lot of demon activity at the same time they should well they should not find it so important to stick to society standards like i understand like girls and boys not being left in a room alone together to a point like bedrooms it shouldn't be allowed but if they're going to a drawing room or they're talking off to the side at a party it shouldn't be immediately considered scandalous unless they have like an escort there going on walks as well or carriage rides it's like come on people they're shadow hunters you let them train and fight demons and you know interrogate down worlders and do all these other things but being alone with a boy is just a no but ending off on this book i gave it a two stars because i honestly just didn't enjoy it i didn't like anything about it it was just very it was a slog to get through and if it wasn't for the fact that i love the shadow hunter world so much wouldn't have finished this. I'm not sure if I could consider this my least favorite book, but it would definitely be up there. I can't, I know I didn't like City of Fallen Angels when I first read it, but that was a long, long time ago. That was like 10 years ago. So I need to reread that to accurately say whether, which, which one was my least favorite. So for now, I'm going to say this one is my least favorite. The second book chain of iron got quite a bit better. In this, we're dealing with a serial killer that's going around killing um, shadow hunters. I didn't write it down, but I knew very early on Belial's entire plan for this. And that, that happens in the third book too, where I 
pretty much guess his plan really early on. In this one, I think I was probably about 80 pages or more into this before I guessed exactly what Belial was doing, why he was doing it. The only thing I didn't guess was Leviathan being a part of this, even though it was brought up. That was the only thing I didn't guess. I guessed everything else. And once again, Leviathan is just there as, oh, this is something that is bad happening to your friends and family. If you want to stop it, let me possess you. And it's like, Belial, we're not that stupid. <laughs> James is not that stupid. I will say I really enjoyed this book a lot more and it felt like the characters were finally gaining a personality each individually and then this is also the book where all of the relationships start and then get devastatingly destroyed in like the last uh actually I think it was like the last chapter everything just came crashing down for all of them or close enough to the last chapter which I'm okay with there was too much angst. There was too much angst and drama in this book. They should have really been focusing more on, you know, the serial killer that's going around. But at the same time, it's kind of hard to when the clay was putting so much restrictions on them. Let's just, this is another thing. The clave and enclave are just morons in every Shadowhunter book. It really shines through in this one and in Chain of Thorns. They are horrible. I think another thing that is on me on this one that I didn't see coming is Lilith being Magnus. I think I was just so happy to see Magnus that I didn't notice that it was not Magnus but someone, you know, masquerading as Magnus to get on um, James and Cordelia's good side and take them to eat on. I, I really should have seen, I, I'm disappointed in myself, but at the same time we had not had Magnus in so long that I just, I needed that little bit of Magnus in my life. And I was taking it no matter what form I was in. While Chain of Iron destroyed all their relationships, Chain of Thorns was here to put them all back together. And we spent half the book doing that. We spent half the book just putting all of these relationships back together. And for some reason, I didn't find that frustrating at all. It's not something I'm used to, especially in like a, a, this book, this physical copy that I have is 778 pages, not counting the novella. And half of that was spent just fixing the relationships that got butchered at the end of Chain of Iron. I'm not sure how I feel about the fact that I didn't find that frustrating at all. And I'm not just talking romantic relationships, but platonic relationships as well. Like between James and Matthew and Cordelia and Lucy. I'll get to that. I'll get to Lucy in a minute. Now I'm going to start with some of the characters, mostly the characters that I hated previously, like Grace and Lucy. I'll start with Cordelia just because, and if I, I may say Cordelia, Cordelia, I'll swap between the two because I'm really sure what, which it is. Um, anyways, the only thing that she really did that made me mad in this book was her kissing Matthew because up to that point we're not led to believe that she loves Matthew in any kind of romantic sense and that this kiss is just to help her forget about all of the crap that's happening and I hated that because she knows and we know that Matthew generally loves her in the romantic sense. And it tore my heart apart because poor Matthew has gone through enough shit. Stop. Just stop. Don't do this and then like completely destroy his heart later on. Very frustrating. I hated her for it. Grace, kind of, I, I've been, I said to myself in the first and second book, there's nothing Grace can do to redeem herself. And she has not redeemed herself 100%. But everything that happened towards the end of this book, all of the fighting that she did, all of like trying to get the fire messages working, warning the Institute that Tatiana was coming, all of that was like little baby steps that was making me like her more. She will always be one of my least favorite characters because of everything she did before that and using the excuse that she didn't have any options. She had no free will of her own to say no, that she had to do everything that she did. No, you didn't, hun. No, you didn't. But I think over time, maybe if we see her later on in another series or something, you know, I'm not going to hate her. I'm not going to like her, but I'm not going to hate her. And I can look at her with more as a morally gray character, maybe. Next, I want to talk about Lucy. 
I hate Lucy more than any other character in these, this series. Like, I'm not just talking about this trilogy. I'm talking about the whole freaking series. It's down here. You can't really see it. She was just annoying with all of her talk about being parapetized with Cord Cordelia, um, writing, all, and all of the snippets of her writing that we had to listen to or read. I hated it wanted the narrator to just not read those parts because if I was reading this book I never would have read passages from the beautiful Cordelia or the beautiful Prince Lucy or whatever the hell her books are called because none of them had anything relevant or important to the plot. They were just there and they sucked. Anyways moving on that was the first two books. This book Lucy went on a whole new level. Get it you know just smoothing over the whole beginning of the book where she raises Jesse from the dead and we have to deal with that whole spiel and James can't go after Cordelia and Matthew because Lucy has pulled this shit right after everything has gone down. Why is she such a bitch? Cordelia does not deserve Lucy coming at her like this. Lucy has kept really harsher and darker secrets than Cordelia has. Cordelia has only kept the fact that she loved her brother from her. That's it. And Lucy can't seem to see that she's made friends with the girl that made her brother miserable in the first place. Like, you know, Cordelia making her brother miserable, that's like nine circles of hell kind of sin in Lucy's eyes. But Grace doing it Oh, well, she did it for a different reason. She did it for a good reason. She was trying to help her brother, and that's all she really wants to do. That's the only person she actually has left in her life. And no, bullshit. That may be true. But you do not treat Cordelia the way you were treating her in this. Like, she's basically the scum on your boot. When you don't treat Jane, uh, Jess, uh, Grace, my gosh, to me, J's and G's in this book. When you don't treat Grace the same, you treat Grace like an actual friend where you're treating Lucy or Lucy my gosh so many characters Lucy is treating Grace like a friend when she's treating Cordelia like trash and it's not even Cordelia's fault if anything Lucy should stay neutral on it or not at least not be as antagonistic as she's being like I understand her wanting to be on James's side because it's her brother but Cordelia was supposed to be your parapetai and your sister-in-law and parapetai are like aren't they basically brothers and sisters in in battle or whatever point is you don't treat people like this Lucy you're a bitch this I I actually ranted about Lucy about 250 pages in. I was like, Lucy is such a horrible character. She's incredibly self-absorbed, dramatic, quick to blame others, finds her family bothersome, refuses to listen if she doesn't like what she hears, and is very improper for the time this book took, set it, took place in. And that's true. She goes to Jesse's room like crazy. It's like, yeah, when Jesse was a ghost, it was fine for him to be in your bedroom. Kind of not, but kind of at the same time. But after he comes back to life, you're just willy-nilly walking into his bedroom half-dressed. That is aggravating, especially when she, she spouts off sometimes about how it's improper to do this or that and the other to other people. And she is always quick to blame people. She's keeping secrets out the wazoo. The entirety of the second book, she's keeping secrets from everyone. And yet she sees nothing wrong with that until like the end of this book when it comes out that she has to say something about it. It's just, it's so frustrating. I shouldn't say the end of this book, the beginning of this book really. But the point is, even at the beginning of this book, she's still treating Cordelia like she has done, like she's killed someone basically. When Lucy has kept a lot darker secrets and honestly, Lucy should have been interrogated by the Clave for half the crap she did. But she doesn't because Jesse protects her, which is very sweet. But Jesse deserved better. Lucy grows in this book. I will give her that. But for 90% of this book, she's a horrible person and I couldn't like her. Just because she was being childish through the majority of it. And I don't want to say snobbish, but kind of snobbish. I can't even articulate how much I just hated her character because there's so many facets of her character I hated. 
Uh, let's get on to the characters I liked. I shouldn't say liked. I liked all of the other characters except for Grace and Lucy, which, well, like I said, Grace has moved into the gray area and Lucy's just horrible. The characters I loved is just Alistair. Alistair is a gem. I love him so much. He deserves the world. Let's give him the world. I do think him and Thomas are like my third or fourth favorite couple now. I just, I love, love him so much. He's just, he's so sweet. One of the cutest things is when he stays outside Mag or Matthew's, I have Magnus on the brain, Matthew's flat to make sure he's okay and it, like if they need him, he'll be there. But it, it's just so cute seeing him outside all sleep deprived and not understanding why Oscar is actually, you know, being friendly towards him. Just him and Thomas having this like this cute little moment together. I just, I loved it so much. There's also the point where he saves Matthew from the killer statue later on in the book, which I was just like, yes, I loved it so much. Anytime Alistair does something badass or like really protective, I love it. He's such a like good older brother too. He protects Cord or tries to protect Cordelia through everything he can and he knows that he can't protect her from all of the fights she has to go in and he's just like, please protect yourself because I can't do it. I can't go with you on these journeys. And it's just like, it's so sweet. <laughs> I love it so much. And I was going to talk about this later, but I'll talk about it now. Also, the fire message that Thomas sends Alistair at the very beginning of the book is so cute and so funny. Dear Alistair, why are you so stupid? I brush my teeth. Don't tell anyone, Thomas. And that just, that actually got a genuine laugh out of me. There's a lot in this book that I called right from the very beginning, like on page 159, I believe it was. Where are you? Charles says vaguely. I'd forgotten. Well, you've missed mother. She was here earlier, but she went home feeling unwell. Just that one sentence, that's the only sentence we get in this entire book to hint to this. She went home feeling unwell. I called that Charlotte was pregnant again. It wasn't, I don't think that was a very hard assumption to come to, but like, that is the first thing that came to my mind and we don't even get the reveal that she's pregnant until the epilogue at the end of the book. I was like, it was a nice seeing like this one little hint that this is what is happening and nothing else. So you can completely brush over it or you can see it and be expecting it through the entirety of the book, which is not a bad thing. So I knew that was coming up and I knew Matthew was eventually going to have to tell them all about his secret to, you know, it's the final book. It has to happen. So when that was revealed at the end and Matthew would, after Matthew had told them the truth about what he had done, and it was just such a loving and heartbreaking moment that I really felt for Matthew. <laughs> and, oh, I want to see from Matthew's perspective so bad to see like the emotional turmoil he was going in during this whole reveal but sadly we didn't get that. There was a couple of things that we didn't get that I wanted, but whatever. Moving on, we have Christopher and the fire messages. I absolutely love that Christopher is the one who created the fire messages. I was so excited that Christopher was playing such a big part in the Shadowhunter world, even in modern time, just from this one invention, especially since I knew that he was going to die. I had always heard, do not trust the family tree, this proves that you should not trust the family tree because Christopher is not supposed to be dead and there's a few children that shouldn't exist, but they do. And I am, I'm just happy that Charles put his footprint in the world of the shadow hunters before he died. I mean, Grace perfected it. Yes, because it wasn't like you know, completed, she completed it. And I'm not sure if that's because she made the fireproof paper or not, but regardless, Grace finished his work, but it is still something that Christopher, you know, created. And I just, I love it. And it's what saved them in the end. And I'm just, Christopher, you're still here with us. The fact that Grace was his unfinished business too was kind of sweet. I hated the couple. But just because of everything she did, I think Christopher was a little bit too forgiving there at the beginning, especially since he kind of seemed like he knew everything that she had done. Not sure how I feel about it in the end, which I guess it doesn't really matter because he's dead and it never happened. Oh, the paladins. The paladins, when that 
got revealed that um, she was a paladin of Lilith and everything, I was like, I kind of seen this coming, but at the same time, how are they going to get out of this? The deal that I had been spoiled for that Lilith was supposed to make with Cordelia didn't happen until way later in the book. So I was racking my brain. I was like, how are they going to actually sever ties with this? And all the research, I understand that was important for them to do. Why didn't they ask an adult, someone who's been around longer, like Magnus? I'm, I'm very happy that um, Hypatia, is that her name? I, hmm, I can't remember. Hypatia, though, that warlock, I'm so glad that she helped in letting us know that Lilith had to be the one to break the bond. At the same time, I just, I got a little frustrated that they weren't asking for help they were just depending on books and just Hypatia's word. So it was kind of irritating. I feel like Magnus was right there in the room at the same time. Could have asked Magnus if he knew anything. Like, I don't know which one of them is older, but surely maybe he would have known something different. Why is Magnus always leaving, by the way? Every time he leaves, something bad happens. Stop leaving, Magnus. Stop leaving us. Going back to foreseeing events, Belial's plan I had completely worked out, except for the whole London control thing, by page 160, so somewhere around there. It was very early on that I had <laughs> come to the conclusion of what he's doing with the Iron Brothers, or not the Iron Brothers, the Iron Sisters and the Silent Brothers, what he's going to be doing with their bodies and how it's going to go about doing that. I first, I saw all of that from so early on and this wasn't even with the perspectives we got from Tatiana. I figured all of this out just based on the clues that our characters were given. By the time Bridgestock came back from trying to find Tatiana and he was letting us know that he had gotten to the iron, the, the iron tombs and that the key had been taken from the Citadel, it's like, well, go check it out. Like more than one of you, go check it out. And while you're at it, come to the same conclusion I've come to. One of you. I know the Clave and the Enclave are morons. Most of the Enclave are morons, not all of them. I know they're stupid, and I know they have restrictions on what they can do, but this seems fairly obvious what is happening, what Belial's plan is. Do something about it before it gets too late. I'm still pissed off that they thought to have a Christmas party while all of this is going down. You people need your priorities straight. I know you wanted to uplift the clave and everything, or the enclave, and make everyone, you know, see that there are bright times in all this darkness or whatever bullshit. Don't, because gatherings like this are the worst thing you can do. And why does no one have a guard, like at the, the front of the Institute? Even Jessamine would have been a nice guard. Can't she like refuse entry to people or something like that? Frickin' tell her Tatiana is not allowed in this building. If Tatiana comes in this building, please warn all of us. Send a warning, a sign, you know, do something to make sure that Tatiana cannot get into the building with a bunch of shadow hunters. Because unless you guys have forgotten, as crazy as she is, she's still a shadow hunter. She's working with the Prince of Hell. She can get into these buildings fairly easily. I just don't understand. You people are stupid. While we're on that, stop trying to gather information from the woman. You put her in the Adamant Citadel, which was already a bad idea. Don't do that again. You find her, just slaughter her. Just don't. Don't trust her. Don't try to get information from her. Just kill her. That way she can't do anything stupid again. Now, if you don't want to kill her, that's fine. Put her under extreme guard. Put her in like a comatose state. Put her in so many binds and like protections and all of that, that there's no way that she could move a muscle without one of you knowing. Stop being stupid. <laughs> is basically what I'm asking. When it comes to people like this, stop giving them so many ways out and then treating people like Will and Tessa like monsters. Like, why? I know that Will and Tessa willingly went to, with them to be questioned and everything, but they were still treated like criminals <laughs> through this entire thing when they did nothing wrong. But Tatiana, who has done everything wrong, but just because she's a little mentally insane from everything that's happened, we're just going to let everything slide <laughs> and just 
put her in a timeout in the Adamant Citadel, where apparently she can go on leisure strolls without alarming anyone. No, but seriously, let's just, let's just let her go to the easiest place in the world to escape from. Why don't we? She's not there by choice. I don't see why the Iron Sisters thought it was okay for her to go on a walk when she is a captive there. They say you can't join the Iron Citadel without, you know, willingly doing it. Maybe there's more to it than that that we just aren't made privy to. Point is, if someone has been sentenced to the Adamant Citadel and they are forced to give their okay to it, or even if they willingly give their okay to it, you do not let those people stroll around like they have done nothing wrong. And then allow those people to escape, kidnap a three-year-old child, torture him by trying to put ruins on him. That was horrifying, by the way. That was, no, no, I was not okay with that. That, mm, the Lightwoods have gone through so much hell in these three books that it's, it's not even funny. They've lost two children, had one child tortured, and just no, no, it's not, it's not. Can, can another family take a hit? Why is the Lightwoods taking so many hits right now? It's not even just Alexander either. They get Christopher. We didn't get to see really any of it. We got to see the aftermath of it. And because of that, it's even more emotional, I think. It was the one time where I'm glad I didn't get to see the events of what happened. It was so emotional seeing the way Thomas reacted afterwards. I was really starting to tear up. I was like, I am not going to cry. I don't want to have a headache. I'm not crying to this, but I almost cried. I'm almost crying now thinking about it because it's just, I felt so bad for Thomas because he didn't know the circumstances. He wasn't there and he blamed himself for it. And then before we could have any heartbreak with the relationship, Matthew stepped in. He's like, Alistair, he needs you right now. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need anybody. He needs you. Come over here and comfort him and comfort him. And I'm like, oh, yes, my heart. <laughs> and thankfully by this point, uh, Tatiana is also dead and incinerated. I don't, how did she catch on fire? Does it go into how and why she caught on fire. Was that like Belial killing her or Lilith burning her body? I said Belial killing her. It was, it was Cordelia that killed her. But like, why did she set on fire? Do we ever get an answer for that? If you guys have an answer to that, please let me know because I'm honestly baffled on whether it was Belial that did it or Lilith that did it or maybe, I don't know, something in her just spontaneously combusts. I don't know because anything can happen in these books. Talking about the family tree for a second, this woman who's making the family trees, she's not, it's no wonder Cassie told us not to trust the family tree. We can't trust the family tree. If this is the person making them, I can't remember her name, but she is basically going around and just like, hey, how many children do you plan on having? Two, six, let me write this down in the family tree. And, <laughs> Some people, she's just pairing off. They're not even married or have anything to do with each other. It's like, sh this woman thinks they're gonna get married, so she puts their names in the family tree. And it's like, why? And what made you think Grace and Christopher were gonna get married if that's the case? Because they are mentioned in the family tree as being together. What made her think those two were together when they had never spent any time together in public? It's just, it's hilarious when you think about it and when you, you really read it, it's like Cassie Clare told us not to trust the family tree, and then she put in writing why we can't trust the family tree. It was it was very nice and satisfying to have answers to why we can't trust something that we were physically given with one of the books. It's like, this, why can we not trust this? I was like, we've been treating this like the holy grail of information when it comes to these families for so long. And can we please get an accurate family tree, please? Because honestly, I need it. Like, we're not going to have any more books set in the past, I don't think. At least there's none planned right now. So, like, can we please have a family tree at least up to current time? I mean, I don't need any information about the future. Not yet, at least. I just need to know, like, like where all these family trees come from, what lines they're in. I need to know. Especially since Anna and Ari are going to be adopting. So does the, what we knew, Izzy's necklace came from, you know, her ancestors and Anna has that necklace. So technically 
doesn't that mean that Alexander, Izzy, and Max weren't Lightwood Lightwoods? They were just adopted in, like, their ancestors were adopted into the family. They were Lightwoods, and then it just got, the, the name got passed down. So what family were they actually? It's a bunch of questions, and I need answers to them. This next bit I'm going to go very quickly on. It's the sex scenes between James and Cordelia. I'm so happy that they got their shit together. And Grace telling the truth. Oh my gosh, Grace told the truth to everybody in this. And it. why can't the rest of the Shadowhunters do this? Why can't they just tell the truth? That is, that's not even a problem with just this series, it, or this trilogy. It's the problem with the entire series, just telling people the truth. No one ever does it. Grace is the only one that does it. And it's one of the reasons why I liked her character a bit more this time around. Because she was telling people the freaking truth. <laughs> so, once she tells Cordelia the truth, her and James make up. Nice. That's very nice. We could have gone through less hell, James, if you just said something from the beginning. Anyways, the sex scenes, and this could be because of the fact that it's set in the time period it is, and we are basically led to believe that showing a, any kind of skin is enough to set a male off, basically, and it's not proper to show any skin in the way Cordelia has been showing skin until you're married. So that could be why it made me so uncomfortable that they had sex multiple times. I was just ready for this entire bit to be over. I was like, can we just get away from this? It also pissed me off that that wasn't when they put the second marriage or wedding ruin on, whatever you want to call it. The second ruin never went on until the end of the book. It's like, why did you not do it during this like, little sexy time you're having? Why do you have to do it after all the shit's gone down? And, you know, I don't know if these weddings, I think they're just symbolic. I don't think they actually do anything. But that's not the point. I wanted it done. I wanted them to put the ruin on. I've been waiting for it for so long now. Just put the damn ruin on. <laughs> that's another thing going on the truth. After this whole reveal and James and Cordelia make up, he tells his friends the truth. And it's like, finally, we're opening up to people. Now we just need Matthew to start telling the truth. And I, I kind of hate the fact that James still doesn't tell his parents until the epilogue. But, you know, we could only have so much. We have to have some tension and drama and secrets. Apparently, everyone needs secrets. Uh, Charles being blackmailed. I called that on page 79 when we got the letter. I was like, I read it, and then I paused the audiobook and reread it and read like little pieces of it, so, like skimmed it. And I was like, is the Inquisitor blackmailing Charles? And it wasn't until, I don't even know a page, it's probably by a hundred or 200 pages later, um, or more actually that Matthew confronts uh, Charles about it. Oh yeah, it's much later. Hold on. Uh, Matthew uh, confronts Charles about it and, you know, brings out the point that he's being blackmailed. And yeah, it's like, I guess I assumed on page 79 that he was getting blackmailed by the Inquisitor, and it wasn't until page 493 that Matthew's like, I think Charles is being blackmailed by the Inquisitor. So that's another thing that I saw right from the beginning. There was actually very little hints in that letter that led to Charles, but there was so few people that could have been being blackmailed by the Inquisitor that I was like, it has to be Charles that's being blackmailed. So I knew that from the very beginning. And it was one of those theories that I had that I had it and I didn't overthink it or anything. I just knew it was happening. It was one of the background things. It really didn't matter until things started uh, really rolling with Will and Tessa being accused of working with Belial and them having to go on trial by the mortal sword and everything. It wasn't until then that it actually mattered because Charles is Charles put a word in for it against the Herondales. And that's when it becomes apparent from to Matthew that the letter is about Charles being blackmailed. And that's, you know, that's when it really becomes important. And it's not until the end where Charles actually redeems himself from being an asshole, saying, hey, the Inquisitor is blackmailing me. This is what he's blackmailing me for. Don't trust a word this guy says. So, Bridgestock, I feel like I've heard the name Bridgestock in the Mortal Instruments series, but I'm not 100% sure. And don't tell me, I'm planning on rereading the series probably next year. So, I will have all the ties in again. 
And it's going to be so fun rereading the series, actually knowing everything now. When they're leaving London and it has like Belial's barrier or whatever that's keeping them inside the city, why did they never think to at least try to use Cortana to break through the barrier? Because Cortana's like break, it cuts through anything. It even cut into that archway portal thing that allowed Cordelia to go to Belial's realm or whoever's realm it was in the first book. And it's like, why didn't you try to like cut the barrier apart? Like you could at least try. It may not have worked. It was just one of those things that irritated me. And then, oh my gosh, it was so creepy seeing this new dead London with all of the mundanes moving around, like their lives are just continuing on. The creepier parts though were the downworlders acting this way. And I, at first I thought maybe it's because they have like more demon blood in them than anything, but I was like, wait, werewolves, vampires, and the like are just, I guess, considered dark creatures, same with fairies, but warlocks are the only ones that have like demon blood in them, correct? I may be wrong on that, but it, like, it makes sense for the warlocks to maybe act that way, but, or even not act that way. Maybe that's why the, because we don't really get to see any warlocks at that point. I mean, Hypatia and Magnus are in Paris, I think, I think it was Paris, and we don't know where Malcolm Fate is, so maybe it's Nephilim with their angel blood isn't affected, and then warlocks with their demon blood isn't affected, and everyone else is affected. That's probably what it is. I don't know why I didn't think of that until now. But at this point, everything is starting to come together. Thomas and Alistair have figured out how to kill the Watchers, which are the, the silent brothers and iron sisters that are being controlled by demons. Uh, Anna and Ari have figured out a way to get into the silent city. Jesse and Grace have figured out how to send the fire messages to everyone to ask for help and everything is going really well. And then in Eden, Matthew is finally confiding in James of what he'd done that started his drinking and then poor Matthew has a seizure. I knew he wasn't going to die in this because we had just killed off Christopher. And this is one of those places in the books where it's like, I don't expect anybody to die here because it sh everything's just gone to shit. And killing off a character at this point is just going to divide our attention from the more pressing issue. So with Christopher, it was like the battle had ended. It's like an it's like the the calm before the storm. It's the perfect spot for someone to die. When Matthew and James were in Eden, it wasn't a good time at all because there is so much tension supposed to be building with Belial and what he's doing in London and the controlling of James and everything. So yeah, James gets possessed, and we really don't get to see that when it's happening. We get like the aftermath of it and everything. So like, which makes sense because James like falls unconscious, but we come in with Lucy and Cordelia and just Matthew standing in the middle of this garden for just by himself, assumedly right after Belial as possessed James leaves. So it's, it's all gone to heck. And it's very interesting actually to see uh, the effect Edon has on Lucy which I wish we had gotten more from her on that experience because unless I'm wrong, we didn't really get her perspective at all. So we're just seeing through Cordelia's eyes how it's affecting her. And I would have loved, even though I hate Lucy's character, I would have loved to have had her perspective of things on how it's affecting her. This final battle too was one of those things where I was like, Lucy can redeem herself here by, which she doesn't. She doesn't. I, I say that, but she really doesn't because I forgot to mention it, but right before this final battle, Lucy had written some, a horrible story about Cordelia and her books. And it is the most hilarious thing I have read from Lucy because one, like the rest of her stories, it's just trash, but it's painting Cordelia in this very vindictive light. And I have never known a character to be so petty and childish as Lucy and then just be forgiven for her being this way. So she's like, grow up, Lucy. So R Lucy calling upon the Silent Brothers and Iron Sisters spirits, ghosts, to help push the demons out of their bodies, to help them fight. I liked it, but at the same time, it's like, you're not doing enough to redeem yourself because this is something you would have already done 
regardless. <laughs> that doesn't fix your personality and the way you treat people. But I loved Belial's death. Belial's death was fantastic. And I, I just loved that God's rays came down and incinerated him basically. and then killed all of the demons that were in the courtyard fighting all the shadow hunters and it's oh I don't, I don't know what they're gonna i just remembered bridget got struck by lightning and it mentions that she's like getting younger or something in the epilogue and it's like i wonder what that is about i wonder if she is kind of maybe immortal now i don't think that's it i think it's more or less that she's just years have been shaved off her life or something or added on to her life, not shaved off her life. So I'm not 100% sure what's going on with Bridget, and I would like answers to that. Then we get a new Belial. I was so confused reading this book after I'd read Ghost of the Shadowhunter Market, and like there's a Belial in the 1939 or something. It was when Jem was going with an Iron Sister to a carnival, and there's Belial there, and this took place like, I know, at least 30 years after the events of the last hours and i'm like wait Belial is still alive i was like i'm how why but we get a new Belial, which is weird but they, they they explain it as like a power balance kind of thing which makes a little bit of sense but at the same time i don't like it i don't like the fact that we have a new Belial, a new prince of hell so every time we kill one of these princes of hell one just respawns in his place. So you're telling me that the reason you can't kill a prince of hell is because they just keep coming back like a wart. Then we get to the epilogue and the epilogue is so freaking long but it's where everything ties up. Matthew tells his parents what has happened to him. James tells his parents what's been happening to him. Then Cordelia and James do the wedding runes. Finally, everyone is going to go on trips or start living together in some capacity. I love that Thomas and Alistair are going to be living together. It's like, oh my gosh, yes, thank you. I want to, I want a whole like spinoff of just all of the, all of my favorite couples through all of the series doing things. We're getting, we got this series, which I believe follows Magnus and Alec and their relationship and all of the good stuff that happens with them, which I haven't read those, so I'm excited to get to them. But I need another series, maybe not a series, maybe just like a standalone book of Thomas and Alistair and them living their best life. Just, I would love that so much. Because honestly, we don't get enough of them in the books, in my opinion. But then again, we never did get enough of Malik, in my opinion, in the other series either. Half of the epilogue is kind of them burying stuff that they want to leave behind, like secrets, expectations, and stuff like that, and just the objects that symbolize those things. It's, it's very nice to see those things, because while the first book I felt like the characters had no personalities, really, it shows how much the characters have grown from the beginning of the series to the end. And it's a very nice kind of like full circle kind of closure for them as characters. Malcolm Fade. <laughs> I, I realize Lucy can't help him and he realizes Lucy can't help him. But at this point, which we find out he was in fairy this whole time, what he was doing in fairy for the last like six months, who knows? It could have been done in a better way. Lucy tells him the reason she can't help him sees that he's furious and then just brushes it off. So I'm going to put all the blame on Lucy <laughs> for the fact that the Blackthorns have to go through so much shit later on in life. Tell someone, if you, even if you can't do anything with Malcolm Fade, even if you can't help him in any, any capacity, you, well, you, off, you should offer to help him at least as long as it's nothing illegal. Tell someone. Tell your parents if you don't want to tell anyone else. Tell Magnus if you don't want to tell anyone who's a shadow hunter. Tell someone. Okay, I'm back. I had to help my mom bring some groceries in. So where did I leave off? I can't remember. I think I was talking about Malcolm Fade and I think I kind of finished my point. Just tell somebody, Lucy. We didn't have to go through all this crap. I think that is it for the book overall, uh, the novella, I it's over Cordelia and Lucy's peripatai ceremony. Couldn't care less. Uh, I did find it interesting where all the ghosts of past peripatai were like 
join together to see the ceremony and to thank Lucy for being respectful and helpful towards Ghost. Gonna be completely honest, she hasn't done much. It seems like the ghosts do more for her than the other way around. But whatever. We do get to see Elias Pangborn and Louisa Ravenscar. I think that's how you say her name. But they are two parapetai that fell in love. And I'm not sure if they're the case that was brought up when we were reading The Dark Artifices or if they're the only case. Like I say this had to have happened more than once or twice. I don't know. It, it was very interesting to see. And it was also the only interesting thing that happened. But that's all I had to talk about that I made a list to talk about. I could rant and rave and go through all of these tabs. I'd have the heck out of this book. I could go through all of these tabs, but some of them are just like 10% of them are just me being angry. Some like another probably 10, 15% is just there for like important information that we need to know. And that's basically it. I think I've gone through like all of the actual important points. So overall rating on all the books, two stars, for a chain of gold, three stars for chain of iron, and 3.5 stars for chain of thorns. I wish I could give half stars on Goodreads. They really need to fix that. But overall, this was my favorite book in the trilogy, which doesn't feel like it's saying much, but it was a good book. I like the fact that we didn't have the majority of the book being taken up by teen angst and drama. The fact that all of the relationships were being resolved and solidified in this book just made me like it that much more. I am not a big drama fan. I absolutely hate drama. Teen angst, for the sake of teen angst, is also one of the things I usually hate in books. And it's one of the things I mainly hate about Cassandra Clare books too. At the beginning it was fine, but once I got to The Dark Artifices, I wanted more political intrigue and stuff like that. Like I wanted things to when they started to get political to stay political not just be brushed off and that's the way it felt like in Queen of Air and Darkness. I wanted more about the politics and we got none of it. We just went back to drama and teen angst and it's like we don't really need this. Like <laughs> please throw us a bone here because I absolutely love the world this is set in but I could do with more of the politics because even though we see that the clave does all of this bad stuff, even with Charlotte as the consul, we didn't get to see them do much good stuff or take charge of anything. I want to see, like, I don't need a whole book about it, but I want to see the clave doing something good and not being the, the secondary villain of the book. I would like that not to be a thing. And I feel like, considering who is in charge in the modern books, I'm hoping that has stopped. I hope the badness has stopped and we finally get some good stuff. But I thought that was Charlotte as well and they're still assholes. I don't know why. We can't just have one generation where there's a good clave. But yes, that is the end of this book talk. I am not exactly sure how I end these anymore. So bye!